semester freshman. Uh, Tara is an English, anthropology, and criminology triple major. Mm -hmm. No minor yet, but thinking about minors. Mm -hmm. And it is to go to law school. And she was part and is part of the hashtag Black U R movement. That's the only way I can describe it. Black Student Caucus. Black Student Caucus movement. And so I thought it would be good to invite her to come and talk about what motivated her to be part of this contemporary movement and what are the challenges to being part of the contemporary movement? Where she, does she think we're going in the contemporary movement? Because you've had an opportunity to hear from people who were uh, from different times and parts of other student movements to see if there's consistency or contrast uh, in how movements today, based on Tyler's uh, perceptions, experience, uh, exist in, in the challenges that so our floor is yours. So uh, thank you all for having me, by the way. Um, it means a lot to me. So I serve as co-spokeswoman of the Black Student Caucus with another student who's a senior named Whitney Sober. Um, and I'll give her accolades. She is the lifeblood of the Black Student Caucus. I, I'm just there to look pretty, mostly. Um, why I got into it, I got into it I would say pre-COVID around January. And um, funnily enough, I was in the union and I was sitting with a group of uh, my friends who were all black and we were just talking about our plight um, as black students here. Um, up until then, it for me, it hadn't been overt. So it wasn't people calling me names or anything like that, just subliminal inherent racism that I guess we all face um, on a day-to-day, -day, so casual racism. Um, the backstory is I had experienced really overt and invert bouts of racism of my high school years. So I kind of had, I know what it felt like. And for students who came from like a black high school who come to this massive university who doesn't, who don't know what it feels like. So in particular, I had a friend from, um, a small town in South Arkansas, predominantly black. You're not facing that on the day, a day to day. And then they get to a land grant institute that's the flagship and they're facing it invert over, you know, and so it was tough seeing them go through that. So we were talking and uh, they were talking about the black student network. It wasn't called the black student caucus at the time. And it was basically just a group me of black students from grad students to faculty members to um, undergrad freshmen who had experienced some form of racism and didn't really have a place to go to talk about it, but also just a place to be freely black. Um, and so they were saying we would have, excuse me, they were saying there was a meeting coming up and actually I don't know where some little hot spot that all black students to go to. And uh, just to come, and there was supposed to be like 50 people there. Currently um, in our caucus, we have about 95 members. Um, so it was supposed to be a massive turnout. Um, it wasn't, but <laughs> that didn't really stop, you know, the fight for it. So I joined because I didn't necessarily have like the situations that they had. So I had a friend who was called, who was an RA, who was called the N-word multiple times by her residents. I um, had a friend who was yelled at as she was walking to a dorm at night. I think she lived in Palm Tree. So it was, it was really me joining to sympathize with my friends. I, when I first joined, I can tell you, honestly, I never thought that I would be, I guess, head honcho <laughs> in some form. And um, so I was joining just to See where we will go. Um, from there, and it kind of happened in the flash, COVID happens. Uh, we're back home. Um, our lives have basically been turned inside out. I can't remember what's being implemented at the time. Our major focus, I will say, is George Floyd um, in the heinous death and his heinous murder and removing the Fulbright statue from campus. So um, I get into the group me still, I'm like, 
a nobody, you know, and uh, we're talking and we have, we're having these consistent meetings and I guess my voice becomes more prominent throughout. And so we're planning and our big thing is to have summertime. So we really have all the time on our hands. COVID happened, school shut down early. And um, our big plan is to go viral, which you know is hashtag black at you are. Uh, we've been playing it for weeks and it happens. Um, and everything explodes. I mean, I never knew what it meant to go viral until that day. <laughs> and it was still just the University of Arkansas. And so um, everybody's on our line. We have senators saying that they support the senators trying to pass bills up here in Fayetteville to um, make hate speech a crime, which is really a very delicate subject. Um, and I think it all happened so fast, we didn't know what to do. And so we had some of us like, let's release a statement. And so we released a statement at the end of the statement. We had uh, my name and Whitney Sobers. Um, and then we're being bombarded at that point. Like people want to speak with us. They want to know what it is. Why haven't we heard of this? How is the university treating us? They didn't know. They're apologizing. Um, and what's even more spectacular is that while we're having this on our own community, we're seeing protests all over the country for George Floyd. So racism as a public health uh, issue is on everybody's mind. Um, and we kind of went from there and then we came back and we said, we shouldn't have released the statement. If you have any questions, please direct them to this uh, Black at UARC email. Um, since then, things have calmed down, but in result of that, we've released demands. Um, and we've, there's been a, a, a making of an advisory, Black student advisory with the chancellor um, and your professor is also a part of it. <laughs> and um, just a multitude, of, a multitude of things. And it's been, it's been a journey for sure. Uh, there was another question. There was a question that you guys asked and I loved all of every single question I received, which is, um, why isn't Black Student Caucus a UA sponsored entity? And so at the time we were thinking about all of these things. The reason we want to be sponsored because if we were to be sponsored by the UA, then everything we do would be critiqued. We would be under UA, so we couldn't do, we couldn't, we were thinking the worst of the worst. So we're like, we can't say the things we want to say about the UA, we can't do this, we can't do that. So we always like, we're going to stay a separate entity, but we're all students, faculty, mm -hmm and grad students at the University of Arkansas. Um, and that's because we had all control of everything we wanted to do. Nobody can really police us. Um, if I could, they would if we were an uh, RSO. Um, let me see. Yeah, I apologize. I lost my whole train of thought. Oh, we had actually thought about, and one of the big questions was how do we get to what, how do we get where we want to go? And what is it exactly do we, where is it that we want to go? And how long is this lasting? Will this be for the rest of existence or will it just be until we get the things we want? Um, that's still a question we're seeking to ask. Um, I think right now we're all of the mind that we want this to be a long-term thing because all of the goals that we have cannot be answered um, in just a couple of months as we clearly see. We're still with the, um, Fulbright statue, which, yep, <laughs> and, uh, that's become one of our biggest things. That's what basically what we're known about now is the Fulbright statue, but it goes way beyond that. As a result of all of that, um, I had one question asking how do professors and faculty look at me now? I haven't really had any overt, like, you've come out against the university. Um, and to be quite honest, most of the support has been, um, well, most of it has been support. Um, and I will say from my white professors and white faculty staff, there's been an outstanding of support. Uh, with my black faculty and staff, not so much. And that was really one of our problems with the black student caucus. Were we alienating the black staff, the black faculty that we currently have? Um, that's still something that we're going through with them saying that 
not them. It's because it's not an us versus them. But a lot of a lot of the faculty and staff saying that we're we're pushing back progress or that we're not doing it the right way or really trying to take over our movement, which that was the whole thing as students, not only were we fighting as students, but we were fighting to get more jobs for them. So it was a lot of juxtaposition and there currently is a lot of juxtaposition. Um, and everything became complicated. You talked, I know you guys talked to Councilman McKissick um, and I sat in on their lecture actually, and he, I asked him, did they ever have internal problems? I was trying to kind of get some info. Um, <laughs> And he said, yes, and we have internal problems, which I guess I should be telling, but I am, um, which is really conducive to being a good movement. We don't want everybody to be the same because not, not all black people are monolithic. Um, and so we're trying to pull that on if we should be Malcolm X or if we should be MLK. Um, and it's, it's hard because everything is up to perspective. Others who have been, who have entered the University of Arkansas campus and have faced rampant racism, and then others like me who faced inverted racism, who has faced it in the past, so I'm not really overturned by it. Um, I have a great support system, um, a job, scholarships, everything. So I haven't, I would say I've had the optimal, like people go to school, this is the life they should be living. But I know what my brothers and sisters are facing. So. It's just like, oh, I have to fight with them. And so we all have different ways we want to approach things. That's been our main goal now, to try and find a consensus while still providing people with the thoughts that they want to have and telling them that those thoughts are very much valid. Um, one thing that my mentor has taught me is that compromise is really the whole thing. That's everyone's goal is compromising, which is, a really tough thing because why should we compromise with our oppressor? That's been our whole um, our whole deal. We're compromising a lot with our oppressor for this. Why should we compromise? Just remove the poor by statute because if we're being plagued by this, but it's not, you know, our voice matters. Um, so we had our internal conflict, and then we realized with racism. It's so multifaceted. So it's, it's not only racism, there's a class issue and there's an age issue. Um, a lot of the feedback we've got from older generations has been not what aligns today. And with our whole movement, it was really based off of the kids who are Gen Z and millennials. I mean, we had the whole movement online. You know, if you weren't a very technological savvy person, you might have missed it. Um, one thing that I have noticed is not a lot of white students know about it. I'll go up to my students, I'm like, oh, I'm part of the Black Student Caucus. They're like, what's the Black Student Caucus? Um, which is really a tough thing to think about. Like the <coughs> impact that it's had at the University of Arkansas, but you don't know what the Black Student Caucus is, which atones for the privilege that white students have. Um, there's a question of what initially sparked the interest in the Fort Bright statue. Um, and I'll say it again, we were walking under the statue in the name of a man who, in reality, didn't want us to be there. He supported the Southern Manifesto and he was a segregationist. And to ask Black students that, while also telling them they're, they're a key component to the University of Arkansas, it was hypocrisy at its finest. Um, and so that's what got us into it. And it was actually another girl years ago who, uh, brought it to the attention of the university, but she doesn't get her, you know, her accomplishments. Her name is Nope, it's just the Black Student Caucus. I don't want to say her name, but yeah, and then we sparked it. We went at Black at UARC and we've been with it ever since. And we're still, there's actually a committee that, and I am part of that committee, that's trying to figure out if Fulbright does deserve a place on this campus. From the Fulbright, problem, um, that's where we saw the most hit back from faculty and staff. Because I think if you're in the older generation, disregard race, you have a, a very different outlook on Fulbright's. A lot of the um, feedback we saw was that why he did all these good things, 
But I mean, he did all these good things for one, one community. What about the black community who we did basically nothing for? Um, which is where we learned about compromise and we learned about perspective um, dead in our face, especially for me. I always thought that I was a um, really open-minded person, but being in this dead in the middle has shown me that I am not at all because everyone's entitled to a perspective and I can't really encroach upon that. Um, so that's kind of what sparked us. Uh, and we moved away from it because we weren't getting the response that we wanted. I have another question, which is, what's the favorite, what's my favorite demand? I don't know who sent it, but I like that question. And they said number two. It was me. It was you. <laughs> yeah, I love that question. Uh, my favorite demand is also number two, which is the uh, compliance and the classes. And then uh, actually it's in line with number three, which is harsher punishment for students who, who don't change their behavior once they have the um, classes. The, uh, I don't know why the word is like going out of my brain. Once they have the classes, students that don't change their behavior, then they have harsher punishment. Those are my ultimate favorite because they're working in tandem, which all the demands are working in tandem. But the reason it was my favorite because it would have been flawed if you implemented one and then not implemented the other, then it was useless. You know, so those are my favorite as well. And thank you for asking. Um, how do you, I've been dying to know. I don't know if this is for later or for now, but I think it's like, all over the place. Go ahead. How would, how how in the world would you go about implementing this? Is the Black Student Caucus like going in about com compromising for the to get this? Like how? <laughs> for two. I think in lieu of having a scandal, our whole thing was we're going to make the university see us. Um, so our very first demand was a statement from the chancellor, which we eventually got. Um, and I think that's the beauty of social media, council culture. So if you don't do it, then your university really won't have a good name, especially for black students who already have a dwindling number here. Um, and so then we created committees. So we have the Fulbright Committee, we have the Black Student Advisory Committee, um, and we go through all the facets of the university. So you have different departments who do different things like um, full disclosure, and I don't know if I'll be get in trouble for this. We met with a man named Counselor Kincaid, who is the general counselor here at the University of Arkansas, to talk about how to get hate speech implemented. Um, we saw a lot of progress, but we, we also were uh, downfalling because you cannot implement hate speech, not in the way that we want it to be, because it is a, a part of a person in the right. Um, so it's kind of been like that. That's how we implement it. We go to different departments. So for more people on the judicial board, which was one of our uh, demands, I think it's the six through nine, maybe. I'm on the judicial board now, <laughs> you know? So it's just like, we we brought that to attention. They opened up the application, I applied, I'm in. And that's how we got things implemented. Um, we had meetings, I know all the summer you saw diversity, equity and inclusion um, meetings and things like that. Um, I guess we forced their hand. Um, it didn't always work out. We were sometimes put in our place um, and we didn't know really how a university worked, but we did at the same time. So that's kind of how we have things implemented. Um, I hope that answers your question. Does it? <laughs> um, um, go ahead. Yeah, I was, leaning more on the education side, not the HP one. Okay, so you know ASG, that, well, there's also a Senate faculty. Um, the thing about, oh, well, faculty Senate. The thing about faculty is they really control everything that they teach. So we brought it to the faculty's attention. Um, the provost brought it to the faculty's attention that this is what the students want. They voted on it in the Senate and that's how it works. But ultimately the chancellor and the fact uh, the chancellor and the provost cannot tell the faculty what they can teach. 
But if we don't see that progress, then it becomes more of a scandal for the university. So it was kind of like we were deep treading it. This is what you need to do. This is what your students want. Um, and to be honest, it's been difficult, but it also hasn't been. I think it depends on every single person because we, I know faculty who don't think race is the issue. They don't think they need to placate black students because at the end of the day, they're just teaching. But I mean, statistics show that black students do better when they have black professors. Statistics show that black students do better when professors address the issues that may be in hand as a black student. You know, things are interpreted different, differently. For example, if I speak to you with Ave, which is African American vernacular English, you know, I, you know, that's that's a that's a dialect of English. People don't know that though. But then my professor may view me as um, uneducated. Uneducated. Uh, yeah, you know, that was one of the uh, big things. That's how we that's how we kind of stress that we need cultural uh competency classes. Yeah. It hasn't, we're still in the process of uh, implementing it. We've had a really good uh, response to it, fortunately for us, which I guess shows that the university is not, everybody's complicated once again, everybody has their own perspective. That's really been the key learning component. Um, so that's how we do that. The faculty said it. And then, let's see. Another question was, how much far did, do I believe the university has until it is truly a place for everyone? Um, it's a really tough question. I will say we're on the uptick. So we are, things are getting better as a whole. Individual perspectives, I can't tell you if my friends feel more comfortable at the University of Arkansas, but I can tell you more positive things are happening. I'm on the judicial board. We have the Fulbright Committee. We have the Black Student Advisory that is supposed to be an advisory for the long, for as long as Chancellor Simons is chancellor. Uh, we have the hiring of new faculty to serve as li li liaisons between us and the chancellor to implement and explain to him our problems and figure out how to, how to get them implemented while still not breaking the law when it comes to First Amendment rights um, and things of that nature. But it has a long way to go. I think you can't really, you can't really say because we are in the South. This is an SEC school. It's predominantly white at the end of the day. You know, it, there's a long way to go. It's like saying, how do you rid racism out of the United States when it's built on it? Um, so that's a tough question. But I think we're on the uptick. Let me see. Do we have any progress for the update of the name change in the Fulbright and Brown? So there's a Fulbright committee. I'm on the Fulbright committee. Um, we're close to closing, but I can't really speak more on it because of what is it? What is it when you can't speak on something because it's against the law? What? <laughs> Never mind. I forgot. Anyways, if I, I spoke on it, then you said what? Privacy, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, no, but I can't really speak. I can't speak to that. Um, no, there's a law. Let's not think about it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, how can white students on campus best support the Black Student Caucus? Um, I think if we want to talk about white students who are doing a very good job of supporting black students, Julia and all comes to name. I mean, she's been at every single thing. She's been implementing, she's been telling everybody like go out. And I, she's really a great ASG president. Um, I think what black people, black students, with, which I know from the students I talk to in the Black Student Caucus, we're tired of hearing, I'm listening, I'm here. You know, that it got old and the amount of times that I have people come into my DMs and tell me, I'm sorry, I'm listening, I'm here. It's too many to count. Um, use your privilege to help us get the things that we want to see on campus, get the changes. 
go and pass res resolutions in ASG. Um, I think one thing about being black is if you come too aggressive, especially for a black woman, you're the angry black woman. But if you come asking for changes as a white person, you're a protester, you're an activist doing, doing God's work or something along those lines, being a good Samaritan. That's where that's your job to come in and say, we need those cultural competency classes. We need more black faculty and staff because at the end of the day, it's not something that benefits black people, it benefits white people too. Um, do I feel as the university administration is truly trying to address the roots of racism and uh, discrimination? Yes. Um, our biggest problem after the forefront was the ageism. Um, older people feeling like they knew how to do it because they had done it before. And then a younger generation telling them that we're not there anymore. We've evolved from a certain place. And having to realize that they were both, both bodies were right in a certain way. Um, I think the university is doing the best that it can, that it can. Um, there are some uh, faculty and staff who are doing a great job. You're a professor. Um, the chancellor is doing the best that he can. Uh, he has a unique position as a white man who's a, a head of a, a university who has to answer to the board of trustees and the president, and then also the alumni and the people who, the population of the of Arkansas. Early on, our biggest thing was, well, why does our voice have to be compromised so you can listen to alumni and people who live here in Arkansas, especially people who've never attended the University of Arkansas? Um, something that I'm still working on is trying to figure out why. But it's true because, again, as I reiterate, different perspectives, everybody has a right to have a voice. As Black people, I can tell you, we're always like, but where we haven't gotten that voice yet. So why can't we be implemented above the masses? Um, but it's tough, especially at a predominantly white institute. But they're trying their best. I don't think, at first we did believe they were placating students. I mean, how many DEI seminars did y'all see this past summer? It was one every week. <laughs> and I don't think it did. I saw some people where it was helping. Um, and there was a lot of white faculty and staff. They were there, they were listening. I'm like, okay, like you know, coming to me, not so much students. Black people know their plight. If they're not open-minded, black students know their plight. If they're not open-minded, then they really don't want to hear anybody else's opinion, which I'm not mad at them about. I mean, no one's listening to your opinion. And then white students, they, there's that privilege again of not having to hear what hear what's going on, just going to school, getting an education, joining a sorority or a frat, and having the time of your life, what college is supposed to be. But administration for sure, and faculty and staff were listening. Yeah. Mm, any more questions? Oh, I'm sorry. How do you say it? Smith or Smith? Smith. Okay. So, a couple of questions. Okay. If you, if you talked about, you know, full price education, first of all, you, you, had, you know, super educators wasn't the nuances, right? Mm -hmm. So, you said, you know, full price, yeah, you did some good, mm -hmm. you know, like the full price scholarship, but what did it do for, you know, black students? And you didn't want them to be there. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sure, I don't know if this came up or not in the committee, but if you, if you know about these nuances, you know, what, how do you, answer like, oh, he might have evolved or we might, you know, change, you know, because and then you already talked about the cancel culture and so many of those things. So how do you and people, you know, with you on the committee, like, try to understand and digest that? Um, one thing I've always tried to uh, implement on the committee, and I'm telling you, I'm not supposed to be saying this, but I'm going to say it, um, is having them to remember that we're there just to talk about if he deserved to be on campus, not to implement anything beyond that. Uh, but that's been in the discussion because one thing I have realized from this summer is that he is a complicated human being. He may have evolved. I wasn't there. 
we had individuals come in. So uh, Dean Randall, Randall Woods came and spoke. Uh, he was, he did a biography on him. We had another man who did a biography on him. Uh, we had um, women and men come and speak who knew him um, and things of that nature. So that's how we understood, how, did he evolve past that or did he stay with his guns? Um, Dr. Woods said verbatim that he had the power eventually to not sign the Southern, Southern Manifesto. He didn't have to sign it. He was secure in his uh, position as a senator. Ultimately, even though we knew all those things about him, it doesn't change the fact that he was a complicated human being and that he did have the Fulbright Fellowship and the scholarship, but he also was a segregationist. So now our big question is, what do we do to put that information out there? What do we say we acknowledge his past, but it doesn't halt us from having a future? Some things that the Black Student Caucus wanted to do was put up a statue of Silas Hart, who was the first uh, African-American to go here, you know, in front of him and have that juxtaposition of them looking at each other, which is like, he's, he's having to face something, but it's also everything that we can do. Or um, having a plaque that says, this man was complicated, he was a segregationist, but he also, also did this and atones to how human beings are complicated. Um, there's so many things that could be done from that and they're still working on it. And I, at this point with everything I've been through, I don't even know the answer. I don't know what, I personally, I don't know what I want. I know what the Black Student Caucus wants, but it's hard. yeah, it's hard admitting that people are complicated, especially when your whole world is surrounded by I'm black, I have to face being black. You know what I'm saying? You had another question? Yes. So, um, I mean, I was, I was looking through the demands. And they're really good. So, who, like, how about that part? Like, who, who all was sitting down? Like, talk about that. Oh, uh, what demand? Okay. okay. One of my. I, my favorite one, I want to know. Okay. So, the. More people of color at work, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so six through ten, they're really, really good. I mean, I think that's a thing, you know. If you can believe it or not, we have a group meet with ninety-five people, and we were sitting there. I mean, we were hyped up, y'all. We said we're gonna make this campaign. We're gonna put the university on blast. People are gonna be behind us. So we were throwing things out. But one of the things I said, I said, can we talk about how the mental health of people of color in America are way worse <laughs> when it, you compare it to their white uh, constituents or whatever. So then we, uh, I would throw that out. Somebody would like and say, oh yeah, I like that. Um, and then we had a, a secretary who would come and try and flip the words, make them sound fancy. So it was whatever you were throwing out. We have some demands that we didn't even put on there. We were, it was, I would say, we probably wrote 50 demands in that movie and we only released like 15 of them. Um, it was just basically people throwing them out, you know, coming in, you didn't even have to be talkative in the group message, but if you had had something that was close to your heart that you wanted to see implemented on campus, then you come in and throw it in there. We discuss it in the group message and we try and get it implemented. Um, we had clear cut leaders. So we had people who were staff um, and they kind of corralled us into having one kind of voice, a consensus. But it was basically run with it and let go. I mean, I had one that I, I didn't put in there, but uh, I played intramural basketball. And one of the things that I often see is refs there kind of give a leeway for white girls but not black girls and it kind of plays into the trope of the angry black woman the white girl who's so innocent and i thought i was just like seeing things i thought i was just mad because i was losing and then my friend was like oh i've seen that and so and so and then she's like and my other friend seen the same thing so that's kind of how we were doing it if it had an actual if somebody threw it out there and they had an actual kind of instance and everybody was agreeing with them that's how we implemented it and then we had our secretary to refine the words 
that's 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 crazy that you bring that up the intramural thing. Mm -hmm. Like I I read uh you know such a collection from from the bad times. They had a whole bad times in the middle thing and same issues that you were still facing, like rap, not just rap, people who came mm -hmm. to me, but also just facing that obviously they were alone, but whatever they would say, like, oh no, you see. Yeah. And it, it what sucks is it's modern day. So you're not as in during the bad times, people are calling you the N-word. You know, here it's just, you know, looking at you funny. I mean, I can tell you every year I've been here, we've had the intramural championship. It's been a predominantly white frat team against a predominantly black one. And it's been like a race war injury. Yeah. Do you have another one? My mom wants to ask questions. Do you have another one? Are you sure? Okay. Do you feel that COVID has an impact on your movement? Do you feel that it's kind of possible because of students not being able to It gave us more time to implement what we wanted. So to really sit back and say, and plan everything out accordingly. But then it kept going on and it got worse and worse. So then all the things we wanted to do when we got back to campus, we were able to do. Um, so it benefited us in one way and then the other way it did. Uh, and and it, it, your, your I don't think so. I don't think so because of the student, the white students and the uh, non-black people of color who want to know about the movement, know about the movement. Uh, my frat friends and my sorority friends, they only know about it because I tell them about it. Uh, I feel like if we would have been back on campus, my frat, there probably would have been more hostility uh, because it's right there in your face. What's up, girl? I think students are like, me being at home when I found out about the Black New York hashtag, I felt powerless. Like, because we were in school, I couldn't do anything to help or to make change from my bed, if that makes sense. I feel like if we'd been on campus, there would have been some kind of organizing, some sort of like protest, some sort of like standing in the union talking about it, just so everyone knew. But I think in that way, it might have been a little bit different. Like just me personally, like I would. And you're so right about we had a protest plan. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be yeah filled out in the courtyard. Um, one thing we were we talked about, we said, well, why not have the protest and make sure everyone's wearing masks? Um, we had to be introspective mm -hmm. and say, how will the public view us mm -hmm. if they'll say, oh, they only care about problems that. Black people, black students care about, but not about everyone else's safety. So then we're like, we won't have a protest. Um, so yeah, that was the big thing. Uh, I can only see it from the perspective of, I know there's gonna be hostility. Yeah. But yeah, I never thought about it in that way. But we definitely did have a protest plan and then we decided not to do it. Well, I definitely see hostility because we felt like, oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question? Okay. Well, I'll go across. Ahmad, is it Ahmad? Okay, how much of an impact do you think the year 2025 is going to I guess, reawakening or actually wake up call has had on the hashtag that you want to like to talk to? Uh, okay. It's tough because it's the most faceted answer. Um, on one hand, I want to be optimistic and say people are now seeing more things uh, and they're being open to it. And George Floyd's murder was what promulgated the action. But then on the other hand, I also see where it's become a trend. So people, it's trending now to be an activist. Um, and I see it really face to face because there, I was a sophomore in high school when Black Lives Matter became a thing. And if you ever said Black Lives Matter, you were a, a pariah, you know, and now everybody has BLM in their uh, Instagram bio. So it's it goes to show 
how it can be a trend, but also how people are sincere about it. And that's the one thing I've kind of been, I've been trying to pay attention to who's been consistently checking in on me saying what's next what are we doing and who when everything calmed down who just moved into the shadows um I think with COVID when it first hit everybody was kind of excited to have their time off so then everybody was literally going out there let me do this let me do this let me take up a new hobby and so it really did promulgate the movement where people were out here in the streets um now that it's kind of calm down in some type of aspect. There's the half who are still in the streets and then there's the half who's just like, I was doing it for the, for the likes, uh, which is unfortunate. Another thing is the election. So now that the election has happened, it's kind of coming back up again, but not so much about black lives now, just about humanity <laughs> at this point. Does, it, does that answer your question? Do you have another one? Um. Do you think it would have had as much of an impact to the other girl there if the other people said it there? Is that including George Floyd's death? No. Which is sad to say. I don't think. It's really, <laughs> that's really sad to say, but I don't think so. I really, truly don't. It probably, it definitely would have been more internal. Uh, so we have Black at UR, everybody was saying something. I think because everybody was on Twitter at the moment. But if we would have had it, nobody would have said anything. We would have just had to directly go to the chancellor and wrestle more with it because now we don't have that leverage of everybody on social media sees what you're doing. So now it's time for you to take action and speak about it or be labeled a villain. So no, I don't, I don't think so, which is really sad. <laughs> Do you have another one? Um, Do you think the administration would have gave more pushback if you didn't? Well, if none of this had ever happened? I don't think so. Um, I have a unique perspective of having a mentor that's an administrator. Um, so he's taught me how to navigate the ins and outs of, of it's, it's really, I'll admit, it's really tough being an administrator of a major university um, because you do have to worry about not only your students, but the alumni, the population, the community, the Fayetteville community. Um, I don't think there would have been more pushback. The biggest thing, if you have, fortunately we have a actual a liberal um, chancellor and the liberal provost and liberal vice chancellor uh, as a whole, but then once it gets past the chancellor, it has to be approved by the board of trustees, the president and then the board of trustees. Um, and really the board of trustees, they have to worry about what greater Arkansas will think or what type of pushback we'll have from parent, uh, parents, especially conservative parents. So it probably would have been harder to implement more things, but it wouldn't be because the administration was trying to hold us back, per se. Um, you have another one? Does that answer your question? Do you have another one? Okay. Uh, Nandi? Nandi. Nandi, okay. Can you mention um, before the uh, Black Lives Matter became a trendy thing mm -hmm. during this time period? And as trends do, they go in and out of fashion. So I was wondering if you or the Black Caucus have thought of any ways to keep the Black Caucus and Black you are Black that you are a very prominent force and presence on the campus if Black Lives Matter does fall out of trend. So I will say that um, we haven't been doing a very good job of maintaining our social media simply because of mental health. Um, our email, we do a decent job of it. But one thing that we did initially come out with as a group was we would have the black at UR tag be like, it wouldn't be just part of that one movement. So if you had a situation happen to you on campus, you could go on your Twitter or your Instagram, post about it, hashtag black at UR, and we will post it for everybody to see. So that's how we kept everything like, this is still going on. It's still happening, you know, um, even when it kind of died down. Um, and then, let me see, there was another thing too. Keeping it alive and keeping it going. Ooh, it literally just left my brain. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna think about it. You got another question though? Um, kind of. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before about the, um, the worries of like, you know, public health safety with having a protest or any form of gathering on campus. Mm -hmm. 
do you think that the like, Purdue Thousand has potential alternatives to still have like an impact on campus without social studies? So physical impact of being here on campus or yeah. it's really been tough because we were like, we can really be hard deal monitored this. You have to sign up to come. You have to say you don't have COVID symptoms, fill out a survey. Um, unfortunately, we're students. And so students don't want to do all of that. I'll be honest, you know, don't nobody want to fill out a survey. <laughs> so uh, we said, what we'll do is we'll hold back to where COVID is lo like lower. And while we're holding back with those ideas, we'll do more and more WebExes, more and more Zoom, stuff like that, alternatives. Um, from my, just me, my perspective, I also serve as the Secretary of Diversity and Student uh, Council, Diversity and Inclusion Student Council. So one thing we've been doing is we'll go, so right now we have a scavenger hunt that we haven't came out with yet, but on the low. <laughs> um, and so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell students, wear your mask, be safe, social distance, but go out and look for these things on campus. Take a video of it and report it, we're gonna post it on Instagram. And that's how we kind of kept being out on campus the same, but still being socially distant. So now I'm gonna try and implement that into Black Student Conference. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one thing. Do you have another one? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope I answered it. Yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> okay. All right. Smith hey, next. Miss next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna let it go? All right. No, have you all ever Mommy. <laughs> yeah. From the perspective of Black Student Caucus, no. Our, one of our biggest, we've had two main quotes that we've lived by. One is by Huey P. Newton, which is, I have the people behind me and the people are my strength. And the other one is from Malcolm X, which is an abbreviation of I can't help anybody else until I help myself. So um, we're of the mind now that we can't really help any other type of student until we help black students, um, which we always felt, and that may seem a little bit heinous to some people, but um, it's true. Um, and we kind of did it as like our own community thing of how you have um, Asian supermarkets, Asian hair stores and black communities and the black dollar doesn't go to the black man. So then we said, we'll implement that in our own community and worry about us first before we can worry about anybody else. As Secretary of Diversity and Inclusion, Student Council, we have. Follow us on Instagram. <laughs> um, uh, so we have lessons of what is a microaggression according to other people. And then depending on the month, we'll be like, what is, a relig what is this religion? Um, what is this like something that people don't know? Um, but as Black Student Caucus, no. And I can tell you right now, we probably won't in the future, just because we're living by that at Malcolm X Creed. Um, until we kind of see some benefits happening for our own people, um, we can't really benefit anybody else. And another thing that I've noticed and that I'm a firm proponent of is that if you benefit one minority group, as a result, it will probably benefit other minority groups. Um, simply because when you're 
discriminating against minorities, you don't really, in the end, it always affects all my, affects all minorities. Uh, so that's kind of how we're breathing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, um, I just felt that the class, like everybody was something to be and that's kind of what our uh, cultural competency um, demand is for, to get that education in all classes, especially classes that are uh, specifically for freshmen. So we have the university perspective class. So we wanted to get that that type of, and be, let it be legitimate, not you come to class and be like, hey, this is what racism is about, don't do it. Like being a certified diversity, equity, and inclusion um, ambassador, and being able to tell that to your students and implement it. And then having that as a freshman and then as a senior, your requirements take something else before you're able to graduate. So that's something that we're trying to do. We're still in the process of doing because like I said, you can't tell a professor what they can and cannot teach unless it passes through the faculty senate. Um, luckily for us, the faculty have been really uh, positively responded. What's up? I could be mentioned earlier today. I do a lot of training and stuff, but I feel like what's done in the physical competency training is very similar to like the alcohol review that we have to do like each and every year. Is that as RA? It could be. So I, I feel like it's very similar to alcohol review and like the second division one or the like second self division that we have to do. So I feel like maybe doing something like that. Maybe. I'll tell you the download. Oh. It is a thing. It's called Dabble. <laughs> it is something that the university does actually use. Um, we've been working with the Multicultural Center, which falls under the Division of Student Affairs, and they have it. It's almost the exact same uh, thing freshmen have to do with alcohol, except it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's called DABA. And so what we wanted to do was, was make it a whole school thing. So a graduation requirement, have to take some sort of it every year. Um, you take it and you do something, that's a violation of the student code of conduct, then you have a more heinous, uh, yeah, more, um, so you have a more heinous result, so then you get suspended, expelled, blah, blah, blah. But it's very much so, we're, it's in the works and we're working to make it seriously more like compact. And actually, as my mom said, to make it more than just black and white as well. Uh, so that actually goes under here, wow. <laughs> Is there another question? Yeah. First of all, you should, you should think about becoming a professor. You, you I feel like I've been stuck in y'all. So. <laughs> no, no, I think you're good. You're a commander with you. You're good. I mean, I, I like it. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and I mean, I think that's my question related to like you said you are from law. So, you know, this is just, I'm, I'm curious. So, why do you want to become a lawyer? And what do you plan to do with it? So, uh, you know, I'm an anthropology major, which is really, you're not supposed to have a favorite major. <laughs> um, I want to go to grad school first before law school. I get a, a master's in cultural anthropology with an emphasis on medicine, medical anthropology, and then go to law school. So my whole thing is eventually becoming uh, an environmental lawyer to help natives retain their land, but also their culture which is where the anthropology background will come in. Um, which is where the anthropology background will come in and eventually come back and teach. So that's the whole thing. Uh, really, it's a really long amount of school because I want to get my <laughs> master's, go to law school, and then eventually get my PhD and be a really good professor. <laughs> um, so that's what I want to do. The reason the Native West is so, um, deep to me is because I am native, but I don't know anything about my heritage. Um, and I had a professor who's my mentor who died recently and he taught medical anthropology and his thing was, his focus when he did field work with natives, he worked with uh, Cherokee, the Cherokee tribe in Oklahoma. So it's kind of following his fist up and still putting my own spin on it. Um, I don't know where I got a little prominent voice from. I don't know how that, Happen. I am kind of outgoing, just asking a kid. Um, but, <laughs> but I don't, yeah, it just happened. <laughs> it's probably the most starstruck I've been this whole time. 
but it's kind of fell into my hands. I've had really great mentors. I mean, really good. And um, Randy Flack in the Multicultural Center, Leslie in the Multicultural Center. And so it's kind of, they pushed me to be on this pedestal, which is really why I love the University of Arkansas. <laughs> but we have this problem. A quote by James Baldwin is uh, kind of a synopsis of the quote is the reason he gets to talk about America so much is because he loves it so much. Uh, go look up that quote because I don't have it all together, but it's a really good quote. So that's kind of my thing. The reason I want the university to be better is because I love it so much. I have great opportunities, great scholarships, a way to sit here and talk to you guys, which has really been phenomenal. Uh, and that's kind of how it occurred. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? The quote, if you want it, is, I love America more than any other country in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Is that it? That's it. Y'all go look at James Paul. Because <laughs> he has some quotes. Uh, I don't want to start with questions. Okay. No, as I said, do you have any Zoom questions? Not with the Yeah, I was going to say something. Yeah, hi. Um, you talked about James Baldwin, and I like reading a lot. So I was, I, I had another question, but I wanted to ask like what favorite books are and like what maybe you've read that's like really um, inspired you towards like doing what you do. One that hit me dead in my chest <laughs> was um, Between the World and Me by ta Coates hit me dead in my chest. Um, I suggest that one. Uh, this is so on trend, but becoming Michelle, you should read the book and then watch the documentary. You'll cry. Um, I really like books that are like is an essay, but not an essay, like an actual story, but they're trying to tell, have a message. Um, so go tell it on the mountain, James Baldwin. Um, let me see. Autobiography of Malcolm X is told to Alex Haley. Uh, Obama's got a new book. Huh? Obama's got a new book. What's it called? Obama's Land. Go read that because we love Obama. <laughs> <laughs> it's long though. It's 700 pages. It's pretty long. We'll do it though. We'll do it. Uh, let me see. Do y'all? I think if you want to be more inclusive, you should read. Um, why are all the black kids sitting together in the lunchroom? <laughs> yeah, Terrell. That, I need to read that book. It is so long though, and I wanted the physical copy, but this semester I found that it's on Mullins online for everybody. There is no physical copy, but so the really 10 year anniversary about, edition. <laughs> oh, right there. Um, so you wanna talk about race. Everyone's reading it, but you need to read it. Like I know people don't wanna be trendy, but you need to read it. Uh, a story just gets the understanding. Oldest time, I know why the cage bird sings, simply because it's a narrative of her life and she's telling it like it's a story, but it's real. You know, like, because there's so many facets. I saw a post the other day about African American vernacular English. You can tell I love linguistics. And um, she said, so if y'all don't know, African-American vernacular English is basically what internet talk it is. That's just, that's them taking that. You should look into it if you don't know that. Um, so somebody says, oh, it's just internet talk. There's so, no such thing as a dialect of English. There's no such thing as a bonnet. And then Maya Angelou says, it just be like that sometimes in the book. So then it showed that there actually is a such thing as ironics. But, uh, I know why the cage bird sings. That hit me dead in my chest too. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? And I will gladly, your email is natecole at uark.edu. I'm telling you, I will go home and send you some. <laughs> yeah, classics for sure. Uh, is there another question you have? Yeah, I was gonna ask about, um, I know Dr. Robinson mentioned there are some similar movements kind of happening in different colleges. So do you guys kind of have, um, is there, what would you say, uh, like a committee that kind of works with all these other campus groups? Like do you guys work with other colleges? 
we do work with other colleges. If we're gonna talk about colleges in state, we work work with we work with UCA. Um, we don't work with Hendrix. Do we work? Uh, we talked with a state um, when we were trying to implement having a black space on campus, uh, like an identity space, like an actual building dedicated to it. It wouldn't be for only black people because that's against the law, but somewhere you can hang that wasn't the multicultural center. We talked to Mizzou. They have their own space um, and it was a lot of fight to get it, but they eventually got it. Um, we, when we were researching on how to get hate speech implemented in our student code of conduct, we look at other institute, uh, institutions ways that they did it. So we looked at, first we looked at the SEC because when you're a school in the SEC, you're more than likely, if your school's gonna do anything, it's gonna be that, that's according to another SEC school. So we looked at UF, um, as everybody was coming out, the UF football players said they were gonna kneel if they didn't get these things implemented. So we had that juxtaposition. Uh, we looked into the, how they were doing things. We looked at to Harvard because if you wanna get a hate speech policy implemented, you look at more liberal schools. So we looked at UC Berkeley and Stanford. Um, yeah, so we're part of, we did UCA, A-State, and Missouri. And I think that's it. So we are. Um, basically trying to figure out how we can better our institutions. And if there was something, and if our institutions didn't want to work with us, if we could go to the Arkansas government um, and figure out how we could do some things. And there were, uh, Lucky for us, we had a law student who's really close to being a lawyer right now. Um, he would come and say, this is what's happening in the law right now. They're trying to implement this. And we would try and get it all together and figure out what's the best way to expunge on all of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. That's all. That's, I mean, that's so cool. So, <laughs> for sure. Uh, do you have another one? Do you have one? I'm just putting stuff in the chat as you do. As you do. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the AAVE talk. I really need to. I um. Vernacular English and me have a very interesting history. Yeah. 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 I spent so much time trying to hide mine. Yep. But now that I'm like unapologetic in my blackness, I'm just like, look, <laughs> I'm going to say some things and it may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I didn't know did code switching was a thing until last year. You said what? I didn't know code switching was even a thing until last year. Oh, yeah. Where'd you grow up? Sorry. Oh, uh, Magnolia, Arkansas. We'll talk later. Who has a question? Yes, that's what I was just making sure I have the right one. I think I found it since I'm not connected to it here, but yeah, I'll send it in our class for sure. I want to make sure I get the recorded one too. Is there any more questions? No. Is there a question from Caleb, Mira, Louise, anybody? No. <laughs> so if there's no more, I think that's it. Thank y'all for having me. If, if there's anything, if there's anything else you want to hear about that I didn't touch on today, please email me. Katie has it. Like, just hit me up. No lie. Um, I read none of those. Yeah, I didn't mean to be a hypocrite. Oh, you're not being a hypocrite. Don't worry about that. Um, yeah, but thank you guys so much for having me. I hope it wasn't completely horrific. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. What time is y'all's class usually over? Oh, uh, we early. <laughs> so just like a quick reminder, um, obviously no class. Uh, and then try to get me. I've I've seen a few Cleo entry drafts come in, but make sure you get them drafted in the 